Good morning, everybody. I'm Amy Leister, and I'm with the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to welcome you today to today's webinar. Before I um, jump into the uh, speakers and talk a little bit about um, our webinar series, the Chamber had held a series of industry partnership meetings to address COVID-19. So when we went into a remote environment, we wanted to make sure that we were reaching out to all of our membership and having discussions on how COVID was affecting them um, and how we can address any concerns or questions they may have as we are in the red, yellow, and coming up on green phase tomorrow. And one of the um, key topics that came out of those industry sector partnership meetings was event and meeting planning post COVID-19. What does that mean for an in-person meeting? Now that we're using Zoom, how do I best host a uh, virtual meeting? So with that, we heard those concerns and put together this, this um, event and it's event meeting and planning post COVID-19. So best practices on how to host a virtual and in-person event and meeting. Um, Val, if you could go to the next slide for me, please. So this, again, this webinar is a series of COVID-19 webinars that we've been doing. And we've done this in partnership with um, our regional partners and it's being recorded and will be posted to the Scranton Chambers website at the end of the day. Um, so we will have um, question and answers that open up at, at the end of this. Um, so at this time, I'm going to introduce our speakers. So we have John Phillips. John is based out of West Piston and is originally from Scranton, Pennsylvania. He has been the owner operator of MCR Design Group since its inception of 2012. The business which is an enterprise specializes in rentals, lighting, production, content, creation, draping, linens, floral, and design. Outside of MCR, John is the owner of 900 Management, which specializes in tour management, production for musical events and festivals, and artist management. Recent clients for his um, 900 Management include Breaking Benjamin, Ice T, Star Set, Public Enemy, and Snoop Dogg. We have Sarah Efforts and she is with Blue Elefante. Blue Elefante has a passion for creating unforgettable moments and bringing people together. She has over 15 years of experience in event planning, marketing. She creates powerful and profitable events, including fundraisers, cocktail receptions, golf tournaments, concerts, fashion shows, music festivals. Sarah has a bachelor's degree in business administration with a focus on marketing and finance, along with a master's degree in project management. And finally, we have Valerie Sarah, who is the CEO of Lesson Alive. Valerie is a former project management office vice president and is a veteran of hosting large scale virtual meetings and events. She has more than 20 years experience managing large projects and project portfolios at Price Waterhouse Coopers and TMG Health Cognizant. Valerie has been hosting virtual meetings and events for global audiences way before Zoom platform was even um, created. Valerie has a bachelor's degree in accounting from the University of Scranton, an MBA from California State University, and will complete her master's in education, innovation instruction in 2020. At this time, I am pleased to turn it over to Valerie Sarah. Thank you, Amy. It's an impressive group we have with us today. So thanks, Sarah and John, for joining me on this panel. Um, a few things we're gonna discuss with everyone here today and review, we're gonna start with the restaurant and event venue guidelines, John is going to take us through that sort of in-person uh, event planning, if you will, that everyone needs to be thinking about over the next few months and give us best practices there. Sarah is then going to take us through virtual event best practices. And we're going to talk a little bit about blended events, and that is those, those types of events where you're actually trying to bring both the in-person and the um, virtual together into one, which is going to be fairly common for the next few months. And then finally, just a little recap, you know, don't forget meetings are events too. So um, we're going to take some of the best practices from John and Sarah and both of their um, discussions and, and bring them forward from the consideration of, of a meeting plan. So with that said, I am actually going to turn this over to John and let him get started on his um, in-person event planning. Thanks, John. 
Thank you. I hope everybody is having a great day today. So my staff was very, very diligent over the last couple of, uh, the last couple of weeks regarding all of the changes that we keep seeing here in the event industry. Uh, you know, the one thing about COVID that nobody really uh, can kind of grasp and uh, wrap their heads around is, you know, we're still kind of getting through the fact of how, one, how contagious it is, two, how it will affect everything, you know, being in person, and three, following all of the state guidelines that are very regimented with all of this. Uh, it's obviously about protecting business. It's about protecting uh all of the people that you have there at that day. And, you know, there's a little bit of tricky uh, navigation, even dealing with the aspect of insurance companies. That's going to be a big part of all of this too, because it all, the, like if you decide to break or bend the rules more or less, it could not work in your favor. So as of now, as June 17th, 2020, uh, this was all outlined by governor Wolf. Uh, no matter what, the, for the absolute basics going into all of this, masks are absolutely to be worn when coming into a property or going through a property in general. So if anybody has to go to the bathroom, if anybody is going to the bar or anything else, the mask has to be worn. While you are sitting down and if you are eating, uh, depending on the group, like it's totally fine to remove the mask. Uh, you know, this also goes along with the grouping guidelines, which we'll get to in a couple of minutes here with all of this. Um, again, social distancing is a big aspect to all of this, six feet at all times. Uh, and as it states here as well, to be consistent and diligent with the sanitizing processes that are being executed. This includes back of house and front of house. So certain measures that should really be great precautions for meeting spaces would be hand sanitizer dispensers leading into ballrooms or meeting rooms, inside of bathrooms, having attendance by doorways, anything that doesn't involve actual touching to spread the virus as we're going along uh, and navigating this process is gonna be very key and prudent to all of this. Uh, standing in a bar area, this is a big one for when it comes to the wedding and event industry. It's not permitted per se. Uh, people can walk up to a bar and they can still be six feet away from each other, more or less. It has to be a distance aspect and as it states, what does this mean for your cocktail hour? Congregating in groups or simply standing around the bar or in the hall is not allowed. Instead, appropriate seating will be required in order to maintain a proper six foot distance between guests. Markings on the floor leading up to the bar will need to be placed in order to guide guests who are waiting in line for drinks. That also being said, this is a very time structured uh, management that you're going to get into with aspects like this. Cocktail tables that actually may need to be reserved for guests would be a very prudent thing to do. So having these implemented and at a standard six foot space is going to be key and prudent. Um, one thing that's actually a really interesting aspect, if nobody uses this program yet, there's a program by the name of All Seated. All Seated has actually implemented COVID guidelines into their floor plans. So again, website is allseated.com. Our company uses this uh, for the room at 900. We also use it for MCR and for other events that we do you know, outside of it for planning and executing floor plans. But they actually have the tools that can be utilized for the current guidelines that are going on right now. It will do a world of wonder in assisting all of you in getting to where you need to be and helping to design the room and space that you need to. Again, face coverings may be removed while seated. Masks are still a requirement for all employees and guests unless a medical condition prevents the ability to safely wear one. Now, this is an interesting thing that I wanna just get to before uh, I go on with this. So the state guidelines stipulate that you do not have to present any kind of documentation whatsoever though to state that you have a medical condition to not wear a mask. This is where everybody gets into a little bit of rule bending with this thing. So in essence, according to Governor Wolf's mandate, all you really need to say is that I have a medical condition. Do I think that's the best thing to do if you don't wanna wear a mask? No, I don't think you should go out period if that's the case. Uh, it basically means that again, an actual medical condition 
means that you do not have to wear one. And being the fact if you do have a serious medical condition, I don't advise you going out at all. Uh, anytime a guest leaves a table at which they are seated at a safe distance from others, they are required to wear a mask. This includes visits to the bathroom, bar, walking around, anywhere in the venue, and while entering and exiting the building, as we did uh, speak about before. This one is my favorite one, and this one is about how many tables you are allowed to have, essentially, or people while seated. Provide at least six feet between parties at tables or physical barriers between customers where booths are arranged back to back. So there were two rules that went out from Governor Wolf. First one being is people from the same household. So if you have multiple parties that are from the same household, and this is the term party that I said was a very loose term to begin with, because it stated not individuals, not clients, not customers, it stated parties, but this was uh, reinforced in the last guideline sent out. If you have 10 people from the same household, they can sit at the same table. You can sit up to 12 in, like as per the state guidelines. Now, when you start getting into multiple parties from different households, this is where it becomes an issue. And we deal by mathematics. Mathematics is the way that I would prefer to do this just because of the fact of the overall aspect of um, insurance policies and the way that events will be enforced. So mathematically, all tables must be a 72 inch round in order to accommodate four people unless individuals are from the same household. Each person sitting at the table takes up 28 inches of space or a little over two feet with one foot distance between parties that live together or the additional six feet of space otherwise in order to comply with this guideline. Mathematically, this is absolutely correct as per the guidelines. It's also important to note that guest tables are to be separated six feet from one another. It is recommended that in the event tables are not to be physically moved that those in between the six foot distance are marked as not for use. So something to just realize when you're doing the seating at these tables as well, the six foot mark from beginning to end begins at the point of the edge of the seat of where the person is sitting, not from the center, but from the edge. So you have to work your way six feet around to the next person. So that's why stating for a 72 inch round, four people by circumference mathematically is the way that this would have to be done according to PA state guidelines. Uh, two methods to determine max maximum occupancy, uh, a limit to 50% of the stated fire code, maximum occup occupancy of 24 or 24 people per 1,000 square feet if there is no applicable fire code ma maximum. When no fire code number is available for outdoor dining, the 24 people per 1,000 square feet number should be applied. So one thing about this is, again, if you have a large tent, tended area outside, but you don't have uh, an overall capacity that's given to you that's coded, the recommendation from MCR would be to get a fire marshal out to code the area for you. It might cost you a couple of bucks to do it, but it could cost you more money in the end if you don't. Uh, and then again, if you have a restaurant, arrange the restaurant or retail food service businesses so that customers sitting at a table are not within six feet of any customer sitting at another table in any direction and calculate the maximum number of customers that can be accommodated. This also means, just so we're aware, that you need to be six feet away from a sidewalk walking area as well. Uh, so essentially, if you're three feet from a barrier inside, like if you have a, an outdoor area, there, you need to be three feet from the barrier and so that another three feet of walking space can be there for people as well. Uh, additional limits may apply to discrete gatherings and events which may be held within the restaurant facility or, or venues such as weddings and catered events. Uh, event capacity in green phase is capped at 250 people, including event staff for all venues. So this is an interesting one and this pertains to trade shows also. So obviously when it comes to the actual room that an event is being held at, it's 250 that's in there. So you actually have to take into account the amount of people that are working for the facility that day as well. Uh, so if you have 20 staff members on, that are gonna be in there at one time, that means that you really should be reducing the cap of your room even more so for an event. Um, trade shows are interesting because let's just say you have 100 vendors that day 
and each vendor for a trade show has one person. So that one person counts as somebody that's gonna be in that capped area. So you're technically allowed 150 people inside of that space at one time, which you can do with time management, as long as you're signing up people in a time management fashion, and you kind of, I have to say this, I'm sorry in the, in the way that I'm saying it, but almost move them like cattle in at one time, out at one time. And what I would do for a trade show, I would put one person on an exit door and one person on an entrance door. So that way you have a clicker of who is actually going in and out of the room at all times. And I would actually do floor markers at six feet. So that way they're almost moving in a uniformed line and going through things. So it's not just essentially a free for all going into an event such as that. Physical guidelines such as tape on the floors or sidewalks and signage on the walls to ensure the customers remain at least six feet apart. Obviously, we did discuss this before, this should be incorporated for guests to follow while standing in line to order drinks at the bar, as well as restrooms and other locations where guests are expected to stand. Tape, large stickers, standing signs, wall signs will help your guests as they remain safe distance from others. I'm a huge advocate of this for the event industry. Um, not that I want to give a shout out to uh, any other business in particular that's out there right now, but Center City Print, who Alex Molfettis, who's the owner, is actually has things of this in stock. Um, you know, we've been talking with him as far as what we're going to be looking to implement in our areas. Uh, but if somebody is in need of something like this, I would recommend giving him a shout out or a call or an email and tell him that you're interested in this for your event. This one is another one of my favorite ones because it pertains to the live musicians. So if live musicians who performed at a restaurant, facility, or venue, they must remain at least six feet apart from patrons and staff. In addition to the amount of room needed for a DJ table or stage for the bed, there needs to be an additional six feet of space between entertainment, guest tables, and or dance area. Stanchions can also help outline a dance area to maintain a six foot distance from entertainment and guest tables. We'd so it is, strongly advise to make sure to do this. And again, um, for anyone that is considering that that's going to have entertainment at their events, um, as a business owner for a venue and also for an event company, I would strongly advise on the fact of making sure that you have all of your liability insurances in place from these vendors and with the potential of a COVID-19 waiver inside of these also. Uh, stating that there is the business is hold harmless in the event that A, the performer has COVID or B, is exposed to it. Utilize reservations for dining on premises to maintain records of all appointments, including contact information for all customers. So this is a big one too, even for the larger event industry, is that you need to have a manifest of all people that are coming in at all times for your property. Uh, it, you should be able to keep this in a cloud-based data system, uh, back it up to a Dropbox, however you need to for the most part. Uh, and again, with event planning, it does stipulate that you need to have a manifest of where everyone is seated at what table, uh, which again, this is normally common practice to begin with, but I would not destroy these files or get rid of them for at least eight to 10 weeks. Afterwards, if there nothing happens from said event, then it's good to dispose of it at that time. Close or remove amenities and congregate areas non-essential to the preparation and service of food or beverages. Due to possible insurance liabilities, it is MCR that's highly discouraging the use of dance floors, photo booths, gaming areas, playgrounds, as it is highly difficult to follow social distancing guidelines and easier for an outbreak to occur. Photo booths may be rented from you know, MCR or any company as long as there's an attendant on site to run and sanitize the equipment for each use. Guests sign up at the designated time to avoid standing in line and photo booth props should not be permitted. Um, our company will not allow them due to the fact of them being shared from person to person. Uh, we won't allow anybody to touch screens. It would be highly recommended that if you do have something like this in an event, that it is required that the vendor has an attendant to run it. Um, I want to also go over the aspect of dance floors. The PA state guidelines state it is not um, something that is off the table, essentially. It's discouraged by the state. So if anybody asks, can I have a dance floor at my wedding? The answer in theory is yes, you can. It doesn't mean you can't have them. 
Um, they're just discouraging the use of it. And quite honestly, it's because of the fact of crowd control and not being able to control the people that will be on it. So if somebody does essentially have COVID and they're not gonna social distance, and let's be honest, we all know what we're like when we have a couple of whiskey sours in us or a couple glasses of wine, such as myself, uh, everybody tends to get a little bit more rowdy. So unless you're gonna enforce it with actual security, this will be a problem. Uh, install physical barriers where remaining physical distance of six feet is difficult. Um, this will be a great one. Uh, you know, again, I know a lot of hotel properties, gaming places have done this, obviously acrylic uh, partitions. You can do this as well at trade shows. We actually have these for tables where you can have an acrylic partition from the vendor to uh, the person that will be attending. Uh, one thing that we're actually doing is sidewalls for every booth at trade shows that are going to be clear. So rather than three foot rails that are off the ground, they're going to be eight foot rails tall. They'll be eight feet tall and then an acrylic uh, 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 sorry, my apologies, the, co the coffee hasn't kicked in yet, a transparent barrier between them so that we are actually able to keep our vendors safe. Uh, desk barriers, et cetera, et cetera, and bars as well. Like having these on bars with like uh, a drink pass through would be really key improvement. Cleaning and sanitizing. Make sure to train all your employees on the importance of this. Gloves, masks, Hand sanitizer, obviously soap and water, washing their hands at all times, cleaning the back of house as much as possible. Uh, as it states here, tabletops, digital menus, check presenters, and digital payments devices after each use. I, if you can get your hands on any Clorox wipes at this point, great. If not, try to use whatever kind of antibacterial uh, cleaner you can get your hands on. And that is all that I have for today. And I will turn it over to the next lovely ladies. Thank you, John. Appreciate the really thorough review. Um, there's an opportunity to ask um, John questions. We'll do some Q&A at the end. So feel free to drop any questions into the chat and um, we'll start to organize those for the end of the session. So thank you again, John. And um, next we're gonna ask Sarah to join us and get into some details and best practices on virtual events. Thanks so much, Valerie. Appreciate it. And thanks, John, for sharing all those great tips for in-person venues and events. I can't wait to get back to experiencing them on the personal side and, and running them on the professional side. So let me just get my screen shared with y'all. Okay, so as Valerie said, I'm going to be going through some virtual event best practices. Um, <clears throat> obviously, Zoom has taken over our lives since uh, this whole pandemic started. And um, I can say that uh, a lot of us have become Zoom experts, whether we liked it or not. And we're just going to go through a couple things to keep in mind. <clears throat> so just a quick um, overview is we're going to talk about just setting up um, and identifying some of your goals some things to consider before you have your virtual event or a virtual component to your in-person event. Um, some things not to forget the night of or ground zero as I like to call it and then <clears throat> pardon me you are follow up afterwards. And I'm going to apologize ahead of time my allergies are kicking my butt this morning so excuse me if I have to clear the throat. Um, so what I like to say is in person or virtual, a successful event has many paths that lead people to engage and act. You know, that, that's the goal is to get people involved, um, a call to action, and then to have some type of response. And it's important to use them all, really brainstorm that out. <clears throat> so as far as what you need to identify is what are your goals for, for your event and for engaging people? Identifying your sponsors or key stakeholders and what resources do you have available to you? So with your goals, are you raising funds for a capital campaign or a specific program or a physical need um, at your organization or place of business? Are you just trying to create community awareness um, and get people involved to support your cause? Do you um, need to increase your donor engagement activity or is it for a team meeting or educational webinar for your staff or committee? Um, all of these things are you know, probably, it, it's more than one and then many more. Um, and I will precede this by saying that I put this together with nonprofits in mind in particular, 
because um, when I was thinking about the landscape of where we're at right now, a lot of nonprofit events, especially in our area, in the greater Lackawanna County, Lackawanna County area, they rely heavily, especially during the summer months and early fall months for their annual fundraisers. <clears throat> and uh, many of them had to be canceled, obviously. And now they're kind of seeking other resources or other ideas like, well, how can we still generate awareness for our cause and meet the financial and physical needs for our program or for those that we serve? And um, so just keep in mind that it's going to be a lot of terminology in the nonprofit landscape, but it obviously is 100% applicable to for profit companies. So going into your sponsors and stakeholders, you know, look at companies and individuals who have supported you in the past. That's your automatic like go to. Um, but then take a sec to make that list of potential people to target. <clears throat> you know, are there other companies that you haven't reached out to yet, or maybe they said no in the past, uh, but now is a great opportunity to kind of follow up and, and give them an update on what you're doing, how you're doing things differently, or what your new needs are. Um, because I always say the worst somebody could say is no, right? So, you know, pound that pavement and make those lists and get your committees and volunteers out there to help spread the word. And then make your plan, your outreach plan. So as far as resources go, we have a ton, right? Um, I would say website is absolutely number one important. Um, usually, I'd attribute maybe about 90% of all of your outreach um, and marketing goals are to drive people to that website. And we use social media, email marketing, um, direct mail pieces to, to help pique people's interest and get them to your website for more information. Um, we also have this wonderful platform, Zoom, like I said, that we've all been using. So identify what your engagement platform is going to be, um, whether it be WebEx, GoToMeetings, there's a bunch of them out there. Also a fundraising platform. <clears throat> if you want to engage things like text to give campaigns, you know, or crowdfunding, um, will you be having a silent auction, you know, or live auction where there's going to be bidding involved? You could do that all virtually, all digitally, um, which actually expands your reach beyond the room. You know, when people are in a ballroom for an event that MCR has so beautifully arranged and designed, um, many times, obviously, you have a limited capacity, um, especially if it is an open event. And, um, and not a private event, but you have the opportunity to go beyond the walls of the ballroom, you know, and let technology do that for you. Um, obviously, your other resources are your volunteers and committee, uh, committee and community ambassadors. These are one of my favorites. So these are people that aren't on your board of directors, aren't an employee of your organization, you know, aren't your normal volunteers, your go-to crew. Uh, but these are people who are passionate about your cause, passionate about what you do, passionate about your company, and they love to share. So utilize them. Let them be an ambassador for you. Um, then obviously align your audiovisual experts. When dealing with tech, you want to make sure that you have um, a company or an individual in place that can basically make things seamless for you and also help lessen your stress uh, for, for your event. And they're gonna be into that nitty gritty, making sure all your transitions are smooth, your audio visual is good. Um, so do a little research and, and make sure that you have somebody queued up for that. Um, obviously, if you're going to be doing any kind of auctions, reach out to an auction company. Um, there's a lot of, lot of options there. And I will say too, like having a professional um, and a user-friendly website, I'm going back to that website again, uh, with the ability to accept donations or a system to gather registrations for you is key because that also kind of builds a database for you as well. <clears throat> so next we're gonna look at our pre-event checklist. Preparation yields confidence and success. Uh, the more prepared you are, obviously the better things will go. So it's time to spread the word and this is the marketing aspect. Um, announce and promote. So use your website and your social media um, and direct mail to announce and promote the event. And even though, um, even if your event is completely virtual, even if it's a, um, uh, a social event, you know, or, or a professional gathering, um, still send out those save the date postcards, you know, or formal invitations um, to a virtual experience. 
because they get something in someone's hand and it still has that intimate connection, which we don't want to lose um, with people sitting on their computers, you know, looking at a screen. <clears throat> so that's one way to still have that personal touch with them and continue your branding across to them. Um, offer a few digital teasers of what people can expect to experience. This is how you're going to generate excitement. Um, that could be just a short little video clip, a little bit of insight into what's going to be happening um, the day of. Another great idea is to mail out swag that participants can use or showcase during the live event. Um, you know, obviously we automatically get like t-shirts, you know, or water bottles or things like that if you're doing a virtual 5k run. Um, send out digital brag images for them to use on social media as well. Um, and that also helps keep costs down too, if the budget is a little thin. There's a lot of things that you can <clears throat> create digitally that people can use on their own personal platforms to, um, to help promote the event or expose your brand. So um, again, set up a landing page to your website. And on there, um, some key things to keep in mind to have on there would be um, whatever special features are going to be taking place during the event, put your speaker profiles on there with their headshots, um, the ability for them to register and sponsor your cause or your event, if applicable. Um, and then always give a brief summary or agenda of what the event will entail and what people can expect. <clears throat> The other thing is if you're using a third party app, um, for example, like Mobile Cause, which is a great text to give platform and um, donation and crowdfunding resource, um, send out those instructions. And um, for example, if they have to download an app to participate for auctions and bidding, do that ahead of time and do it often because you want people to be prepared and not fumbling with technology. Um, and if they do run into an issue, you know, you don't want to take their attention and focus away from your presentation and the program that uh, is, is streaming and is happening live at the moment. So get that all out of the way. And then during the event, when it is live, make sure that those instructions and resources are still readily available and easy to access and find for people. <clears throat> you want to try to remove you know, all stumbling blocks as much as possible. Um, another great idea is sending branded virtual Zoom backgrounds. You know, John, we see today is, is uh, in San Francisco <laughs> and uh, with his Zoom background, which is great. And you also have the ability to make your own custom ones with, with your logo, you know, or a nice image behind you. Um, but still keep it simple because remember that you are the focus and you don't want to take too much away from that. Um, and then... We go into tech prep. So this is the nitty gritty and I'll breeze over this pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> most importantly, write a tech program that identifies the roles and responsibilities of everybody that's involved with your presenters, um, who's controlling cameras and audio um, and screen shares and the order of program. Um, it also should include basically a script too for your um, participants. So if you're doing a webinar um, and with introductions and such like this morning, like write that out and have people practice them. Um, determine what your interaction standards are going to be. And um, that was done wonderfully by the ladies this morning. Uh, by Val is as far as um, identifying the chat, you know, will you be using Q&A? Will that be open? Who's responsible for managing question and answer time? Um, and uh, any other features that the platform may provide to you that you have at your disposal. <clears throat> Another important thing to especially for um, events uh, that are going to be recorded like this one or um, entertainment events where you've got um, music or celebrities or anything like that, make sure that you have a uh, updated photo and video release form that's signed by everybody um, with permission to share the content afterwards to a broader audience. Um, and if you are using music in your production in, in any way, shape or form, just check those copyright laws. Um, if you're playing music as you're waiting for everybody to gather, um, just make sure that you've kind of dotted your I's and crossed your T's on that one. And lastly is record everything. Um, 
The reason for that is not only on internally for you to kind of go back to and have a resource um, and kind of self evaluate, but that's content and content is is gold right just like data is gold. Um, you can use this content to engage others in the future, right? People who missed it, but you can also segment out this content, especially if you had multiple speakers, you can um, get a great video editor and, uh, or do it in a program yourself and splice out those sessions and make them individual aspects um, with keynote features. And you can release this as paid content in the future, as an example. Um, it could be part of a subscription perk. For example, if you donate $1,000 or above, you'll have access to our keynote library. Um, and lastly is practice, practice, practice. Don't wait until showtime and the night of to run through the tech program. You know, make sure you're fully comfortable, fully acclimated with everything. Um, next is looking at different ways to engage sponsors and, um, and uh, enlist people to activate with you. So just like with any other fundraising event or corporate recognition event, create those spon sponsor packages. But now be thinking more of what can we give them? What can we entice them with um, in a digital landscape, right? Um, that could be sharing their logo in other, in other ways, you know, putting, putting them everywhere. Um, mentioning them during the program night, you know, maybe having them physically be a face for part of your pre-recorded message, you know, for the evening. Um, but be specific with it and just get super creative, you know, with what you're offering. Um, another thing I really like is issuing virtual tickets. So even though you're not needing a ticket to get in the door, um, sending a virtual ticket with a code maybe or um, based and, and basing it on like ticket or sponsor levels that gains them access to special VIP features like maybe a virtual pre party a gift card. Um, or if you're doing raffles, maybe that gives them one free digital raffle ticket. It could also allow them to have access to a virtual meet and greet with a VIP speaker or the president of your organization before or after the main event. So there's a lot of little things that you can do to kind of spice it up for them. And again, the ambassador thing that I spoke to earlier um, to help them have them help promote the event, build your audience, um, offer them some brand and digital material or something special for them to flaunt and display over time and effort supporting you. <clears throat> Next is giving something to be excited about. So um, as we know, sitting in front of a computer screen isn't always fun. A lot of us do that all day long for our jobs. Um, so the last thing we want to do for maybe it's a, a 7 p.m. program. Um, it's like, yeah, we're really interested, but physically, motivationally, you know, it's 655 and you're like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I want to log on right now or I'm just, I'm too tired. So this is where um, this can help people stay committed to their RSVP. Um, <clears throat> if you're doing a silent auction, that's obviously a, a, a great interactive thing, something for people to get excited about, and it can help raise a lot of money. Um, I do recommend that if you're going to do this, open it up at least a week ahead of time. So that way you can generate early bids, get people excited, um, and it's a great sponsorship opportunity too because you can get different sponsors and donors involved um, with some of the items that may be offered. Door prizes is another thing, maybe like the first 20 people to log on um, that, you, that you watch for get a, uh, you know, can get something mailed to them or get a special discount code to one of the sponsors. Um, services or products that will be involved throughout the night. <clears throat> Entertainment, um, keep your audience in mind. Um, you may, you know, love this band or this comedian, but is it going to be appropriate for your audience um, or, you know, an individual speaker? So, and, and is it appropriate for the style of event? Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And lastly is testimonials. Testimonials are huge. Those that have been, have benefited from your services or product, those um, who advocate for you, um, use their story and people love stories. So use their story to further your mission and, and make sure it is mission centric. Um, but you can also use that ahead of time if it's pre-recorded. use that as some teasers, as some of that promo material leading up to the event. And it makes it a lot easier from a fundraising aspect to make that ask as well, because it gives something um, for people to identify and connect with. All right, so the night of, things not to forget. I'm going to go through this quickly. <coughs> Pardon me. 
A, make sure you have a strong internet connection first and foremost, um, especially for those of us who are broadcasting at home and you have other household members um, with their multiple devices eating up the bandwidth. So what I usually do um, when I have to run an evening webinar, I ask my household members to turn off their Wi-Fi on all their devices for that hour until my program is over, just to be safe and make sure you're in a, you're in a quiet space because um, background noise is very, very distracting, especially when someone is on screen and they're giving a powerful message. Um, you don't want any anything to disrupt that. Um, we talked about virtual backgrounds, um, announce your best practices um, for the event on the tech side of things. Um, and reference your agenda, thank your sponsors profusely and create branded or cause related activities. There's a ton of activities out there. Um, once you start Googling, it, it will flood your screen. And there's some really, really cool things from scavenger hunts and murder mysteries to um, different types of games that you can play in trivia. So <clears throat> where it's appropriate, incorporate some of those things, especially in meetings too, just for some um, really good like team building aspects. There's a lot of material out there that you can do virtually that could be a lot of fun and great icebreakers. Um, and then provide a social space for your attendees. This could be the in-app uh, chat like we have today for Zoom. But if you want to kind of do something separate and leave that, designate that chat area for something else, um, another great tool is Slack. And you know it's a free app, you download it on your phone, on your computer, and um, you set up a channel for everybody to interact with. And the great thing about Slack, apart from um, like Zoom chat, is that Slack doesn't go away when the event is over. So if you've had people engaging and connecting <clears throat> during your time together, they can continue building that relationship and those conversations afterwards, which is you know a fantastic thing. Um, lastly, keep it short, a formal program you should really keep it around 30 to 40 minutes and everything important that you want to say and, and drill home um, really target that in the first 20 minutes you know for people's attention spans um, and people don't always come in when you start and stay for the whole thing um, you know until you stop broadcasting so you want to make sure that you really get your core content in there at the peak of when people's attentions are there and then um, intersperse some entertainment but if you're having uh, additional entertainment or activities, um, make sure that, like I said, your messaging is already done so that those things become optional. And if people want to stay and still engage and interact, they have the option to do so, but they're not going to make, they're not going to miss your main points or, um, or your main ask there. <clears throat> so after the event, the must do's, and this is something that I think, um, all of us who have run events, you know, or, or volunteered to help run events is you have all of this lead up, all of this work, and then the night of, and it's like all the pieces come together and the stress is high, but the reward is high because you see it all come together in a beautiful way and it's exciting. And then when it's done, you slump in your chair and you're exhausted and you're like, oh, so happy that's over um, because it just drains you. Um, but you're also filled with, you know, almost um, reenacting it and reliving it in your head on you know, what went well, what didn't, um, you know, what we want to remember last time or for next time. So make sure you do schedule a post-op with your team and do that brain dump. You know, get everybody's insights and observations because everybody that's involved in it <clears throat> saw the event through a different lens, especially pertaining to what their role was for the time. Um, so make sure that you have that time to do so. Um, this is also where you want to consider the rest of the audience that was there and those that were not there. So share that recording of the event as soon as you're you know, able to with your tech crew. Um, make sure you put it on your website and post it to social if it's appropriate. Segment out that recorded content for use in the future uh, for future promotions. So strategize, and this is something you should think about beforehand, you know, strategize how you want to use that content afterwards and in the future. Um, and the most important thing is the data. All of those people that registered um, or in Zoom, even in Zoom, it'll have um, an attendee list and that's data and that is context, that's your future. Um, so download that um, information, get it into your database and you know, make sure it's flagged so you know what they participated in and how, start making a plan of how you can engage them in the future. 
Um, and lastly, those that attended but didn't give, if this was a fundraiser, um, this is a great opportunity for that one more ask without being pesty or inappropriate. Um, just compose a special email message just for them. Maybe include a little clip from the night, you know, kind of a little recap, something that was powerful and meaningful. And thank them for being there. And then just simply have another donate button. Say, you know, there's still time to help us reach our goal. Um, and let that be their ask. And then leave them be. Leave them alone after that. Lastly, send out a thank you note um, to those, obviously, who, who were involved and who did give. Um, make sure all your messaging is consistent and, and branded. And um, make sure that you recognize them, that what was raised and the impact that they had made being involved. And that just kind of takes that event in a good wrapped up package um, and connecting them still, again, in an intimate way. Um, review with your team, like I said before, what went well and what can be improved. Um, and a lot of times we make these lists and we do that brain dump <clears throat> and it's, you know, in some notebook, um, they were sitting around a boardroom talking about, or, you know, you type it into your computer and it's some file somewhere. Be, um, be diligent with it and, and be specific. So with those notes, I'll be as thorough as possible because a year from now, you know, if you write this one little phrase, you may have no idea what it's pertaining to. Um, but then don't just let it sit in a folder somewhere, you know, pull it out for next year and let that be your starting point where approved. Because a lot of times you make those notes, we forget about them and it's next year and we're starting from scratch. So that is basically, um, my run through and a lot of things to consider for virtual events. I tried to keep it short. <laughs> Sorry, Val. <laughs> it was great, but Sarah. We're, we're, we're going we're getting on there. kudos in the in the chat over to me for all of the great information. So thanks for for being so diligent and sharing so much information um, with the group. And just to remind everybody, this is recorded. So you know, if you didn't have a chance to take thorough notes from from all these great tips from Sarah and John, you'll have a chance to watch the recording. And if anyone has questions. Um, drop them in the chat. I'm going to wrap up with just a couple of um, additional pieces of information for everybody to think about with um, really getting into what, you know, you want to think in terms of blended events. So Sarah spoke about um, all of the things to think about for virtual events and John spoke about the in-person. So just want to give you some other things here, um, some tips if you're trying to pull it all together and offer a blended opportunity. Um, you know, this is gonna be important for a lot of events this year. There are going to be attendees who, um, you know, just might not feel comfortable coming in person, even though, you know, you, you might be able to offer an in-person program. Um, you might still wanna offer a, a plan B, or you just might wanna consider from a risk management perspective, you know, in the event, you know, something changes in our environment and you're unable to hold a planned event, having a virtual option available um, from a risk management perspective. So just a few things to think about. This could be its own session in and of itself, but it's important to make your attendance options clear and flexible for people. So they might think they wanna attend in person, but then something changes their mind. And so giving them an opportunity to switch um, is the best case scenario. That is somewhat complicated in planning, especially if you're talking about uh, meal preparation or, you know, John went through all of the many complexities that come with in-person event planning and spacing. And, you know, you, you only can do so much from a flexibility standpoint, but that's ideal. Um, Sarah spoke about, you know, still sending swag to people and, it's important that if you are going to deliver um, things like programs or swag bags to your in-person audience, that you also get them to your online audience as, as well. Um, and, you know, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Sarah spoke about this. She said, practice, practice, practice. You know, a two audience event is very complex, right? You need help. You need extra support. You basically doubled what you were attempting to do in terms of managing audiences. So, you know, prepare your staff and yourself for that and definitely have the appropriate help. Um, and when we say rehearse, don't just rehearse with your presenters and your staff, but rehearse with some um, guest attendees, if you will, to make sure the experience is what you think it's going to be um, for those guests. 
it's a great idea to try to connect your in-person and online audiences. And, and Sarah actually touched on a few things where she was talking about integrating technology um, in a way that would very much allow for your in-person and your online audiences to be connected. But you know, maybe it's as simple as you know, it, you know having a camera angle in the, the ballroom that from time to time your in-person attendees can actually see what's going on um, physically, or certainly when it comes to the entertainment, ensure everybody's able to enjoy the same entertainment. So, you know, everything isn't going to work one for one between your audiences, um, but connecting them as much as possible and allowing them even to see each other is a great idea. And then finally, don't neglect the online audience when your in-person event starts to go. Make sure there's somebody whose job it is to constantly monitor that group. Um, you've got to be watching for tech issues, those who need help, or, you know, any, anything else that might come up, um, as, as well as, you know, keeping them engaged. So it's definitely important that you keep your eye on them and don't neglect that audience. Um, okay, and I'm going to just wrap up just with a couple of quick reminders. I know, you know, we said we would talk a little bit about meeting planning, and the reality is meetings are events, too. So the things that you heard from John and Sarah very much apply to those important meetings where you might be treating them really like you would an event. Um, so a couple reminders, and I just want to take a second and remind everyone that um, several weeks ago, we did a program with the Chamber, which is a Zoom 101 session, and we did speak specifically about online meetings and spend a lot of time talking about that. So you might want to go back and, and dig into that. It's a full hour. Um, takes you through the Zoom technology as well as best practices for virtual meetings. Um, but you know, take the time to make sure you've got the technology mastered and that your presenters are all experienced with the technology platform. You know, again, practice, 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 rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Um, everybody needs to be comfortable because you don't want anything to to hold up a meeting and have your attendees um, either unable to participate or your presenters unable to present their material. And with that, a tech backup plan. Sarah spoke about that. Um, it's really critical, especially that your presenters have a tech backup plan. That might mean something as simple as having a hotspot available for them, um, using a cell phone in case their internet goes down, or having a second host who is responsible for having a copy of the slides in case something happens and all of a sudden the slide presentation goes down. But um, you know, have have more than one person ready to jump in if um, the event is that important, if the meeting is that important, um, have backup. There's a lot of engagement features. Uh, you know, we touched on the use of chat. There's polling in Zoom. Um, most all of the large scale um, web conferencing platforms that everyone's using today has different engagement features. Zoom definitely has the most right now, but you can find them everywhere. Um, you know, people can obviously use their video, they can use their audio, and um, you know, just think about other ways to engage to keep people connected so it's not just, um, you know, a meeting where one person is, is speaking. Um, and then finally, you know, get help if it's important. If it's a large group, it's hard to manage being both the um, presenter and being the host. There's a lot happening in a virtual meeting. And so you really need to think about, you know, having, you know, having a little bit of extra help, um, somebody who's really comfortable with the technology, somebody who can keep an eye on, on the chat room or, um, you know, keep an eye on the attendees and make sure everybody has what they need to be successful. So um, with that said, we're going to take a couple of minutes and I'm going to invite Sarah and John back and really invite anyone who has any questions um, that they would like to, you know, bring into this group today. I, I you know, appreciate that um, most of our attendees here stayed on with us through all of the different segments, whether it was in person or virtual. And so um, if you have a question, you can use the chat function and send it over. Um, to us. So um, we've got the first couple coming in and the first one, John, is for you. So there's a question um, about the limit defined on an outdoor event. Is that 24 people per 1,000 square feet? Can you reiterate that? You spoke a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the state as of right now for for tents has designated that for every 1,000 square feet that is outside, 
um, essentially is designated for 24 people. That's, that's not a joke. Um, you know, and the thing about it is, is can you get around that? Yeah, you, you can get around that. But uh, as stated, the best way to get around that, uh, because you're bringing in an infrastructure, you know, so the, the, the infrastructure itself isn't coded at that point, unless there's a spe specific certificate that is being provided by the person that is bringing in the infrastructure that day. So in order to, if, if they don't have it, what you're going to have to do is, again, I would recommend getting a fire marshal out to recode the area for you based upon what the local law and guidelines will dictate. Now, and this is where uh, it gets a little bit funny too, you know, when it comes to uh, the laws, it's not just state law, but local municipalities are also coming up with their own designations and aspects for what they're allowing as well. So, you know, I would even contact uh, your local government office to see if they have any differences of what, you know, Governor Wolf is stipulating as well. Like Wilkes-Barre, from what I'm aware of when I was speaking to uh, Robert at the Westmoreland Club, uh, Wilkes-Barre I think has a couple of different guidelines uh, outside of what the state is, is allowing. So again, as I would state, talk to your local government officials and make sure you have it in document also. Uh, for any kind of event that you would do or be putting on. Um, if it goes against the overall state guidelines that the governor is giving, like I said, have it in document, have it in your files, just as a safety precaution and a backup. You know, that's again for uh, liability and your insurance companies. And John, you, you just, you know, mentioned liability and I'm not sure if this is something you can cover, but there is a question coming in about, about liability. And the question is, is the venue that you utilize responsible for following ensuring social distancing guidelines or is the business that's booking the event liable for that? Do you, do you have any feedback on that from your experience? Well, this is where it, this is where the waters get murky with everybody. Um, you know, and the one thing about this is, again, this all comes down to um, what ifs. And that's kind of the world that we're living in. And the event industry right now is we're living in a world of what if. Uh, so, you know, it, and part of me when I get out of uh, a little bit of the event industry here, but, you know, this is why venues have to almost take it upon themselves or the, uh, or the host of the event uh, for insurance purposes, why I stated that waivers may have to be a thing that you will have to implement, uh, whether it's a digital waiver or whether it's a physical one upon entering the building. Again, if, uh, if the president is going to hold a 7,000 person rally inside of the state of Arizona, uh, and he's going to implement a waiver, then quite honestly, that's kind of your barrier that's going to exist between you and a lawsuit. So me personally, you know, if it, if I was hosting a larger event, I would absolutely, absolutely implement a waiver going into it, whether it was a, a wedding, whether it's a private function or whatever. I, I mean, th this is just the times that we're living in, um, you know, and again, you don't want to have a problem where there is a COVID outbreak and it does happen at your event. And then somebody is going to label you, the host, the vendors, and everybody liable in a class action lawsuit. Uh, I, and if the state is implementing all of these measures to state, we need to know where this person came from or where they were seated at these tables. There's a reason for that. It's because they want to trace where this came from. Uh, so if you have to follow these guidelines, and if you did have this at your event, then in essence, you're becoming partially liable for having this person at your event. So it's like Thanks, I said, I, I would absolutely implement a waiver of some kind. Okay, thank you for that feedback. And there's only one other question here, and it's um, requesting a tutorial for using Zoom for um, those who are just attending meetings. And that's an easy one. I can direct you actually back to the, the chamber webinar, Zoom 101. The first 10 minutes or so of that webinar is really for any type of user. Um, if you're just an attendee and you don't need to host, the first couple of minutes will walk you through that. You can also just go out to zoom.com and there are a ton of very short video tutorials um, for anyone who is, you know, just needs to know how to be a participant. Um, with that said, that's all of the questions today. And I want to welcome um, Amy back so we can, um, you know, wrap up for today.
Okay, great. Thank you so much, Sarah, John, and Val. That was um, a great comprehensive um, overview of how to plan and moving forward. Um, again, it's going to be posted and the recording is going to be posted to the Scranton Chamber website, hopefully by the end of the day. So please reference that. And if you are thinking of planning any of these virtual in-person meetings, events, um, and you need assistance, please reach out to John, uh, Sarah, and Valerie, and our other members that are working in um, these areas. And all contact information can be provided in our online business directory at scrantonchamber.com. And if you have any questions or need any referrals, please reach out to us and our team at the chamber and we can um, forward you contacts to our membership. So thank you again. Um, thank you for attending and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, guys.